Welcome to our seminar series here at the Age of Salman, collaboration with the library. Today we have the pleasure to invite uh, Professor William Kretschmar, uh, that is a Harry and Jenny Wilson Professor in Humanities at the University of Georgia, and also has an appointment as a professor at the University of Ulu in Finland. Uh, he has been, he has a very impressive uh, uh, background. He has been editing the American Linguistic Atlas for 34 years. When, as you told us on the way here from the restaurant, it was paper then, and now it's all computers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, he has been part of uh, the American pronunciations uh, for, the Amer for the Oxford Online Dictionary of the English Language. Uh, he has been working on several other interesting projects, such as the archives for the tobacco industry. Um, and he has been very influential in developing digital methods for analysis and presentation of language variations and complexity science. And today you will speak to us about the collaboration between digital humanities and libraries and why you think this is uh, very important uh, with your professional experience. Thank you very much for uh, being with us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in Uppsala. Now, being a Finn, I always thought it was Uppsala. Um, <laughs> but then now I know better. Um, so, I'm, I'm to... Uh, the talk. Now, what you'll find out is that I'm a very old-fashioned person, which means that I have a kind of formal written-out talk, which is going to be okay to listen to because I'm pretty good at it, but uh, it also means that if you want it, just send me an email and I'll send it to you. And uh, you can uh, look at it at your leisure. So, uh, on with the show. So the phrase, if you stand still, you die, comes from a famous 1970 book called Up the Organization, in which a guy called Robert Townsend wrote that almost everybody subscribes to the myth that a company has to keep growing. If you stand still, you die, they say. It turns out that this phrase, 50 years later, also is relevant to digital humanities projects. These projects, especially big ones like mine, the Linguistic Atlas Project that Anna mentioned, or my American English Pronunciation Database, which um, I did for Oxford uh, a long time ago, but its latest edition is out uh, uh, a year or so ago from Routledge. Uh, now, these are not the kind of thing that you can ever finish. Uh, particular stages of these projects can be completed but continuing institutional support is important for the long-term sustainability of these projects and the products made from them. What I want to focus on today is this theme of sustainability and what we've tried to do about it at the University of Georgia. In short, I think that collaboration with the University Library is the only realistic option for long-term sustainability. If digital projects stand still, they're going to die. Um, and a library is the only part of our institutional structure that can keep them moving enough to save them. So the stand still or die problem for digital humanities projects is twofold. Our first big problem is that our digital environment keeps changing around us and that's not going to stop. The invention of printing on paper provided a technology with which information could be stored over the long term. We have nothing like that for digital storage. We've gone from punch cards to tape to magnetic and optical spinning disks to non-volatile flash memory, all in just a couple of decades. Moreover, the operating environment in which these media are used has also been changing, and at any one time there have been multiple popular F operating systems in common use. Uh, just uh, some of you are Apple people and some of you are not, so it's a relevant problem. Uh, <laughs> For digital humanities, we therefore face the problem of continually having to change media and operating environments just to keep our information alive and accessible. Our second big problem follows from the first. We need to have access continuously to new resources, not to create new programs or products, but just to keep up with changes in the media and operating environments. Even the seemingly most secure digital humanities projects, say an icon like the Oxford English Dictionary, face difficult budget challenges, and in fact, the OED has not kept up with the continuing development of the pronunciation database I made for them. And thus, my colleague Clive Upton and I are now working with Routledge. 
the fact is that most digital humanities projects, even famous ones, are managed by just one developer or by a small working group with inconsistent and unreliable funding. We don't have access to grant funding in the same way that our colleagues in the natural and physical sciences have it, with renewable grants that can keep laboratories running for long periods. The sustainability of a project relies on continuity of both the developer as a human resource and funding as a material resource. Of course, the stand still or die problem includes the certainty that the original developer of any project will be lost at some point, whether to a change in interests or research focus or to retirement or people do die. Uh, we're dealing with this problem right now in Georgia. The obvious implication for sustainability is that somebody else besides the original developer will have to keep the digital project alive. Our digital projects will die without adaptation to the changing media and environments, and the adaptation will not happen without continuing sources of new financial and new human capital. In what follows, I'll be illustrating problems and solutions from my Linguistic Atlas project. Uh, a little about that. Hans Korat started it in 1929, and beginning with the publication of his first volumes during World War II, it's been famous for its maps. And that's one of the things I'll be talking uh, about here at Uppsala over the next couple of days is maps. Uh, in this slide, what you see at left is a map from the original linguistic atlas of New England with responses, that is, different names for a cabinet with drawers in your bedroom where you keep your socks. Uh, they probably have different names for that piece of furniture in Swedish, too, but I don't know what they are. Um, and that these are, were all hand-lettered on a base map during the Depression in America when draftsmen were really cheap. Uh, at right, you see an analytical map from 1949 in which the actual responses are no longer there. And what you do have is lines, are called isoglosses, that are supposed to show the limit of occurrence for where people use different linguistic features. These maps were both handmade. Uh, the, I told you about the one at the left, and the one at the right has lines that were applied by hand with so-called draftsman shadings. When I started in the field in the 1970s, that's what we did. And draftsman shadings are things that are uh, on a page that has sticky stuff on the back, like a stamp. And you'd use a little stylus to cut them out, pick them up, put them physically where you wanted it on the map, and then the other side of the stylus, stylus stylus would burnish it down so it would make it stick. But that's how we used to make that um, before computers. Now, digital conversion of the Atlas started in the 1980s, first at the University of Chicago, and then for the mid-80s at the University of Georgia after I moved there. We've been interested to digitize our large archival body of interview data on paper field book pages and audio tape at the same time that we continue to collect new information about American English in uh, native digital format. The Atlas has gone through several generations of programming and computer tools, each of which required special funding. And I would take too long to give you a list of all the grants that we've had. So here are some pictures. At left, you see an original field book page. Uh, one of the tasks there is figuring out the handwriting. It's mm -hmm. paleography. In the bottom center, you see one of our first computer maps from the late 1980s, which, as far as I know, is the first GIS in linguistics. Uh, at the top, you see the home page of our second website revision from the early 2000s. It's based on Python programming, which is still available on our current website, although it's very flaky, so watch out if you go there. Um, finally, at right, you see a waveform from our digital conversion of old audio tape which we're uh, now using to produce automated vowel measurement, and I'm doing a paper about that tomorrow, uh, if you want to know more. The Atlas is lucky in that it has a small endowment and that we've received major grant funding from our <coughs> national funding agencies. Uh, the greatest continuing resource for the Atlas, though, has been the faculty contract for its developer, me, um, which has also provided offer space. So the university has been funding the Atlas through my faculty contract. Uh, the need for funding has become ever greater as we succeeded in our digital stages. The work exceeded the capacity of one developer, and I've had to spend more and more time uh, finding money 
just to keep the operation alive while my students did the programming now. Under such circumstances, and I think these are typical of successful projects, without the faculty contract and continuing fundraising, our digital atlas would die. Uh, about 15 years ago, an institutional option came up. When my university created a research computing center as a service in addition to the institution's other uh, computing resources, the Atlas was one of the first clients so that we could avoid the continuing expensive system administration in my uh, Atlas office. Indeed, I wrote the proposal for it. As somebody, my colleagues from the natural and physical sciences can, uh, thought was a professional writer. So it was just my job to do the writing and they could come up with the ideas. Uh, this is, I think, familiar for other people in the humanities. And you should yes. do this because you get to write what it says. Yeah. <laughs> and great. Now, the uh, Research Computing Center was mainly a high-performance computing place that offered parallel processing for intense computational tasks. It did, however, offer some web and storage facilities. For a while, the Atlas used those until the Atlas, as a single project, completely filled up the one terabyte of storage available in the facility. Uh, they threw me out. <laughs> uh, uh, then, over the course of several years, the Research Computing Center changed from an essentially institutional budget to a fee-based service for researchers with annual external funding. This meant that humanities projects like the Atlas without that funding, while not excluded from the Research Computing Center, had to hope for sufferance from the paying customers, our friends, the biologists, the chemists, and the physicists. This option did not appear likely to sustain our Atlas digital projects and archives over the long term. Enter the university library. Uh, at the University of Georgia, as at most research universities, the library is faced with the problem of archiving materials in many formats ranging from paper to film to a wide range of digital formats to ensure that the content is preserved for future generations. Among these, Georgia has a large collection of film and magnetic tape built around the entries to the Peabody Awards, one of the premier awards in electronic media. The library has developed a plan to archive and care for this collection that involves creating the best possible digital archival copy of an object, usually a radio or TV program, while also deriving a viewing copy at the same time. The digital archive copy is then stored uh, on offline magnetic storage. Uh, the best available technology right now is called LTO, or uh, which stands for Linear Tape Open, a cartridge of magnetic tape that resembles an old 8-track cartridge, if you're as old as I am and you remember what those are. Uh, it's about this big. Uh, and uh, it adheres to an open standard supported by the members of the LTO consortium, which includes Hewlett-Packard and IBM. Uh, the LTO cartridge has been the same in appearance and function and size, <coughs> but the capacity has grown over the years from 100 gigabytes in the original version to 12 terabytes in the current version, which is called LTO 8. Uh, as the format evolves, the capacity of the cartridges will keep growing. Uh, at some point, they'll be replaced by some other format, but we're confident that an upgrade path will be provided given the complete dominance of this tape for archival, big archival storage projects. The library, then, offered to incorporate the multimedia collections of the Atlas alongside its other electronic media holdings. That our current 35 terabytes of audio and image files in the Atlas Archive don't compare in scale to what the library needs for the Peabody materials. Unlike the Research Computing Center, devoted mainly to high-performance computer processing, the mission of the library includes both archives and dissemination, now increasingly of digital materials as well as traditional paper. So, uh, we agree on cooperation. The central points of our agreement cover the sustainability problems already highlighted. How will we deal with changing media and operating environments? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to do the work? Our first decision was to follow the library's plan to base its multimedia archive on LTO computer tape. The current price for an LTO cassette, if you buy them in bulk, is about 20 bucks, uh, much less than the equivalent storage on a hard drive. So 12 terabytes, 20 bucks, you know, it's, we're getting down towards 
a dollar a terabyte, which is pretty cheap uh, for long-term archival storage. However, it's necessary to refresh, uh, refresh these tapes periodically. LTO tape is rated to last up to 30 years, but the drive mechanisms will only be usable for about 10 years, and new versions of the LTO standard appear every two or three years, and they're only backward compatible for one version. So, the library has agreed to include Atlas tapes in its regular tape refresh cycle so that they get brought up from the older standard to uh, the latest LTO numbers. Uh, moreover, the library will have the opportunity across these cycles to update its technology so that Atlas data can be copied next time on newer tape drives or to another medium that we don't know what it is yet. The refresh cycle will also need to accommodate changes in operating environments. The data on the tapes can be converted to new formats as required when the tape is refreshed. Thus, the library can provide both the new technology and continuing resources for a sustainable archive as part of its mission at the university. This essentially doesn't cost it extra money uh, because our, our project is just not very big in comparison to other things that they have to do. The Atlas Project, on the other hand, has to provide the resources to get the archive started. Uh, owing to our need to protect the privacy of our research subjects, digital copies of the original interview sound recordings will be preserved in a dark archive, not for public access. Each recording will also be preserved in a public version with the sensitive information edited out. This practice mirrors the library's plan to create two copies of multimedia holdings one archival and one for public access. Original LTO tapes of both the dark and public versions are created in our Atlas office for deposit to the library multimedia archive. So we have an LTO tape drive in the office. We're actually on our second one uh, at the moment so that we can make these tapes and then take them by sneaker net uh, across the street to the library. Uh, Finally, we agreed on terms for creation of an Atlas web presence on library servers. When we uh, began to understand that the Research Computing Center wouldn't be a good host for the Atlas, uh, we shifted everything. Uh, the UGA library had been a leader in the digital library movement in America. Uh, for instance, through its Galileo statewide uh, online resource. Uh, if you log into Galileo, you can get there from libraries all across the state. It's, uh, it's in Sweden, Sweden and Georgia are not too far different in size. This would be a national thing uh, that the library was providing. Uh, the Atlas website was shoehorned originally into corners of this Galileo infrastructure. However, even though we shared hardware resources, the Atlas site was kept strictly separate from other Galileo and library computer functions. We couldn't use general university resources because our site is heavily interactive with GIS uh, for our materials from uh, the American southern states. Uh, and the university didn't permit interactive sites on its uh, equipment. We need for our users of the Atlas to be able to make maps and conduct complex searches of the data, as well as download data files in our library presence. We could maintain an interactive resource so long as we completely walled it off from other library functions. So the Atlas was not incorporated into the general library, but kept separate on library equipment. One problem with any interactive website uh, is the need to work on the scripts or programming that enables the interactive function. It's a different kind of problem entirely just to provide system administration, to keep the site current, and secure with patches and updates. I don't know if any of you develop on Drupal, they seem to have an update every other week, sort of like Microsoft. Uh, and this uh, is continuing work. So having the Atlas site at the library solved the second problem, but not the first. Besides Galileo, there was already a digital uh, library facility in Georgia that carried out its own digital projects. But those projects had to solicit their own external resources, just as the Atlas has had to solicit external funding for every digital advance. The library just doesn't have IT staff sitting around waiting to take on programming work for faculty projects, whether for new projects or programming maintenance on existing projects. We are aware, for instance, 
that at one time there was a plan for the well-established Carolina Digital Library and Archives, uh, named sort of like your library here, uh, but this one at the University of North Carolina, where they received and cared for faculty digital research projects. But CDLA, uh, like our own Georgia Digital Library, relied on external research funding for its operations, and it turned out not to be practical just to add this new function to its agenda, and CDLA basically collapsed and was reorganized. Mm -hmm. This common experience demands that we make a strong distinction now between con content and tools. The library can archive content, but its staff can't at present take responsibility to maintain tools such as an interactive website that makes content and visualizations of the content available to users. We expect that people on the Atlas will continue to have to maintain our website and any tools we make. When we moved the site to the library, we engaged in a very successful collaboration on the creation of a user interface with faculty and staff members at the University of Oulu. The Lycan system, originally written in Java as a toolbox for different software tools for display and analysis of multimedia information, has been implemented for the uh, Atlas data. We also maintain a simpler, separate system just for download of files from our file structure in the most sustainable way possible, which to us means separation of basic web access, as for file downloads, from more highly scripted interactive functions like GIS for mapping. There will be times when the Atlas doesn't have resources to be very active in site building and maintenance, and knowing that, we have to prepare for it by creating the most stable forms of user access in addition to interactive tools. Uh, our decision then is just to use a file structure. File structures don't change. They're always going to be there. At the same time that we were building the Lycan system, I also wrote the proposal for what would become our new digital humanities platform at the university called DigiLab. First, a little backstory. At Georgia, we have a long history of involvement with the digital humanities. When I first came to Georgia in 1985 to do a job talk, that talk was a demonstration of our first ever computer routines for the Linguistic Atlas Project, the very first talk about digitization. Uh, the program was an implementation in the old DBase database system prepared by an outside programmer, and it didn't work. Uh, after that, I became the programmer for the project for many years and made things that did work. Uh, in 1996, we were working on ways to make use of online resources interactive, and we implemented a site in this new thing called the World Wide Web, on which users could use GIS to make interactive maps with our data, as you see here. Shortly after that, some colleagues and I in the English department started trying to create a digital humanities program. Uh, we succeeded in making our first faculty appointment, David Gantz, who, after a couple of years, moved on to accept a Canada chair in New Brunswick. In order to create the buzz to replace him, we hosted the International Meeting in the Humanities, it's now called the DH Meeting, it's in Utrecht this year, uh, in 2003. And our plan worked and we hired Steve Ramsey as our new digital humanities person who taught programming and other things to humanists for several years, but then he was hired away by Nebraska which was building a big new library collaboration with the humanities. Surprise, surprise. You know, uh -huh. great minds think alike. We replaced Steve with Amanda Gailey, whose specialty was text encoding. Fitting because Georgia was a charter member of the Text Encoding Initiative, uh, the international standard setting body for archival markup for text. But Amanda, too, was hired away by Nebraska after a couple of years. We replaced her, eventually, with Chris, Chris Eckett, uh, whom we hired after we developed a special proposal about digital humanities in the university is a massive amount of bureaucracy. Uh, but he also left the university after a few years. Uh, his problem was a visa problem. He was a Canadian, and you know what's been going on with immigration in America um, lately, and he got caught in, in this somehow and had to go back to Canada. So the point of all this is that even though we had significant research in digital humanities, we could not build a digital humanities program based on faculty lines. Uh, people come and go. And the lines, at least at my university, are not durable. 
that need to be argued for every time they come open. Thus, my proposal for DigiLab. It represented a change in strategy away from hiring people to instead create a place where digital humanities could be centered. So back to the DigiLab proposal. Uh, my application was submitted to create a faculty research cluster, so-called. At Georgia, our research foundation allocates to our Wilson Center for the Humanities and Arts some of the money that they collect in overhead costs from outside grants, which mainly go for research in the natural, physical, and health sciences. Much less money is available to us in the humanities in America. So, for example, my top grant from our National Endowment for the Humanities is only $350,000 to spend over a couple of years, while our Tropical Diseases Research Group gets millions every year. Uh, and their grants are renewable, and ours aren't. Uh, the Wilson Center for the Humanities and Arts could thus have a competition to award up to five grants of $30,000 a year over a three-year period uh, with money that the uh, natural scientists let flow downhill to the humanities. My proposal had four major goals. First, DigiLab as a place should have a central location so that faculty and students from many departments could use it easily. Next, DigiLab should provide the infrastructure for interactive programs to get around the university IT policy that excludes them. My proposal specified the use of virtual machine technology. In a VM implementation with many licenses on a single hardware platform, each VM instance is completely separate from the others. Uh, each VM instance runs its own software, including web services, and nothing that happens in one VM instance affects what happens in other VM instances, even though they're running on the same physical equipment. This means that any security arise, uh, issue that arises inside of a VM instance is walled off from the rest of the hardware and software, and so the risk of interactive programs is effectively controlled. The third goal of the proposal was to create a very large amount of mass storage. I learned from my earlier experience at the Research Computing Center that, the humani that humanities computing is essentially different from what the physical and natural scientists do in that we want to store and share information while our colleagues in STEM fields just want to process it and share only the results. We thus needed to prioritize storage, including multiple terabytes for the Atlas, so that we could safely store information and serve it to users over the web. As an aside, I can tell you that we keep uh, over 50 terabytes of hard disk storage in the Atlas office, and our DigiLab pre uh, presence is currently running about two terabytes. So not huge in today's term, but mm -hmm. significant. You know, not something that you would necessarily want to do um, in your office. Now finally, my fourth goal was to provide training in digital humanities software and techniques for our humanities faculty and students. While we do offer semester-long courses for credit in digital humanities, and the computer science department offers some programming courses, our faculty and students need to be able to learn how to use programs like Excel at a basic level or the R statistical environment for their individual research projects. DigiLab, I hope, would become the place for experienced users of software and specialized hardware like scanners or audio processing equipment uh, could share their knowledge with others. For this purpose, we needed a teaching facility with large display system and computer workstations. The overarching goal for DigiLab as a central place for digital humanities was to create a community of people who could work together to achieve their research goals using digital tools. As you'll expect, since I'm talking to you about it, my proposal succeeded. <laughs> uh, but not entirely on its own terms. The DigiLab proposal was joined with one to create a center for virtual history. This meant that DigiLab had 15,000 a year over three years, and the historians also had 15,000 a year over three years. It wasn't possible to equip the DigiLab space with infrastructure and storage for that little money. However, the partnership of the Atlas with the library came to the rescue. Uh, as soon as the faculty research cluster award was made, the university librarian and I started planning. He suggested that the physical location of the DigiLab be established in an unused section of the main library at the center of campus. 
He applied for university funding to refurbish that area, uh, and his application was accepted in the second year, so that by the end of the second year of the faculty research cluster, we had a new physical location for DigiLab, equipped with computer display and workstations. By then, $30,000 of my money went with the library space and physical rehab, and we had a place. Uh, the library continued to invest its own funding along with money from the research cluster award and money that I was able to contribute from outside grants I had so that just for me, they've gotten about $75,000 um, uh, over the years. Uh, to create the storage and infrastructure we needed for DigiLab, including where the Atlas would run. In addition, the library provided the system administration for the new equipment and hired two people for the library staff to operate DigiLab, a digital humanities coordinator whose office is at DigiLab and a GIS librarian whose office is downstairs, but still she's active in the DigiLab environment. These two staff members have been invaluable for bringing together the community of research, uh, researchers that I was hoping to create. So the DigiLab proposal was one thing, but the active support of the library, both collegial and financial, was essential to make it all work. So what have we got? Our DigiLab physical space is designed for teaching and multiple use. Computer workstations are located on the side of the room, and most of the rest of the seating and tables are on wheels so that users can configure the room however they need to. There are large display screens in two places so that people teaching or leading training sessions can set up at the end or at the side of the room. The DH coordinator's office is at the end of the teaching space down at that far. You could imagine an office extended off the right over there. Uh, and we have a rack of laptops stored in there that can be used in the teaching space when we need them. But we only have about eight computer workstations along the wall. Uh, but we have 20-some laptops, so that we can uh, make it so everybody in the room has a computer. All, the other, uh, all of the infrastructure, computer hardware, and storage is located elsewhere in the library, near the other library big resources, not in DigiLab itself so that the system administrators have easy access to it for maintenance and users in DigiLab access the resources over the university network. The physical layout works well for us. Other faculty members and I have regularly taught classes in DigiLab and the room easily accommodates up to about 30 people at a time. We also have lectures and demonstrations there. Uh, if we were having this lecture at the University of Georgia, DigiLab is where it would be. Um, when the physical space is not in use for classes or lectures, other people from the university community can come in and use the computers or use the space for collaborative work. Our software resources installed on all of the lab computers and laptops consists of tools commonly used in digital humanities. Computers do have the Outlook suite of programs too, so Excel and Access and Word are available. The Adobe Graphics Suite is there, and both ArcGIS and QGIS if you want to make maps. Uh, text editors for XML and programming are available, and the most common free corpus tools from Lawrence Anthony's Ant series, uh, the AntConf is the one that most people use, uh, are on there. Uh, I have uh, had students use network analysis with Gephi, and I've taught Perl in DigiLab, so Perl is on those. Um, the computer science department teaches Java in all of its introductory classes, so it's useful to have a program that's better suited to text analysis at DigiLab. For those of you who don't know, uh, management of strings and the regex, regular expression system, began with Perl. Uh, and so it's been updated. Perl is also a really stable thing, unlike Python, where every new update crashes your old program. Uh, Perl doesn't do that. Perl is backwards compatible, so it's worth teaching as a both as a scripting language and for you can make big programs in it. I'm not sure I would, uh, but you can if you want to. Okay, uh, we have regularly offered seminars in the use of R at DigiLab, and MATLAB is the one that gets taught in our statistics department. So it's uh, uh, a difference there. 
Uh, library staff will install other programs on the computers and laptops if they're needed for particular classic, uh, or classes or training seminars, such as the JUMP, JMP, visualization program that's pretty popular at Georgia, takes your Excel data and does cool stuff with it. Um, the DigiLab website also offers tutorials on the use of different kinds of software recorded from the presentations we make at DigiLab, so that if you miss the seminar, you can go back and watch it. I'm happy to report that after we built DigiLab, faculty and students have come and used it. It's now about five years old. Uh, while my Linguistic Atlas project was the poster child for hosting faculty research at the library, uh, and it now has space on the DigiLab infrastructure, many of my colleagues have joined me. If you can read some of this small print here, you'll see that uh, there are several from people in the English department on Amelia Opie and Shakespeare and a, a medieval manuscript called The Harvard Hours uh, and Mina Loy, a modern uh, uh, actress. Two of these <coughs> projects are collaborations with scholars at other institutions so that in part DigiLab is presenting collaborative work that crosses institutions. There's also a project here on Greek myth from the classics department. Faculty members from other departments, too, have been active at DigiLab and haven't got their projects up yet. Each project is set up on a VM license on the infrastructure hardware with access to a large quantity of, score, of storage. If you click on one of the links, here's the one about Greek myth. You go immediately to the website for the project. Each of these has a URL on the library's domain, libs.uga.edu. The library began with just a few VM licenses and now has lots uh, to accommodate the demand. Uh, the Atlas project currently uses three VM slices, so uh, you, can't just, you can't get by with just a couple. You have to have lots. Um, the Atlas site now lives at DigiLab with its new Lycan visualizations, and here's a map of all the locations of, of speakers and you'll see that it uses the familiar map and symbols from the Google API. Uh, our old site, still linked at left for those of you who want to use it, but it's flaky, watch out, it will crash on you at the, at, uh, for no reason at all, just because of Python. It was good software when it started, but now Python has killed it. Uh, now, discussed, uh, as I was discussing above, the data download center part, which you see up there at the top left, is the maintenance-free, last-forever file structure for users to download our data. While the Lycan portion of the site offers a graphical user interface for searching, displaying, and mapping the data, and we hope it doesn't go bad like the Python one did. Uh, the Center for Virtual History is well represented on the DigiLab site. While I used my part of the faculty research cluster money to help build DigiLab, the historians used their resources to work on their projects. Uh, one of them is called CSI Dixie, and that uses coroner's records to help map the health history of the American South. Um, that, the developer of that got uh, an ACLS digital fellowship. ACLS is a, a fancy humanities association in America, so this is a pretty good uh, grant. So that's how that uh, really was developed. The Invasion of America site tries to map what happened to Native American territory in the settlement of the continent. Here, the red patches indicate reservations created for Native Americans, while the blue shows areas where Native Americans used to have homelands, but don't anymore. The mapping occupation site on this page shows where the U.S. Army had significant bases during the Reconstruction period <coughs> after our Civil War in the middle of the 19th century. And on other pages, maps uh, it maps other aspects of occupation during the period. Like CSI Dixie, map mapping occupation benefited from fellowship funding from the American Council of Learned Societies. The newest project in the eHistory project is Private Voices, which tracks language in Civil War era letters. This map shows locations where a prefixing in words like a hunting or a singing uh, occurred in the letters more or less generally across the eastern United States. This project is a co uh, collaboration between my colleague Steve Barry at Georgia 
and faculty and students at Missouri State University with assistance from uh, Michael Montgomery at the University of South Carolina. So this is another example of a cross-institutional project that we're hosting. Uh, these e-history projects make excellent use of GIS tools. The final group of sites at DigiLab consists of some local Athens, Georgia projects about African Americans and cemeteries. This is work that takes advantage of our local setting for the university, and it's important that our DigiLab site should not just be kind of highly specialized for scholars, but that we engage with the community as well. Um, and that it also, you also see here some digital exhibits created in the library and the university more generally. The cemetery site, for instance, takes advantage of student work in, uh, from classes where they collected historical and cultural information uh, from three local burial, site, burial sites, the Brooklyn and Oconee Hill cemeteries, and from an African-American burial site where the university's Baldwin Hall is now located. This has become a political mess, because how could you build a university building on top of a cemetery? This is not good. So they're trying to figure out what to do about it now. So DigiLab serves as a focal point to show off local events and information as well as host scholarly projects. Uh, listed as an affiliated site is my Complex Systems and the Humanities page. After DigiLab was established, my research, faculty research cluster funding, like the e-history cluster funding, was continued by the Wilson Center, and I've used it to employ a graduate assistant to help build a site to introduce the subject of complex systems to people in the humanities. As I will discuss in other talks later this week, complexity science provides a new model for how to understand linguistic and cultural practices in human populations. Complex systems aren't part of the training for humanists, so this site attempts to provide the basic information that we should all know. The site also links to a computer simulation of language diffusion, that's what you see down here at the bottom, uh, a so-called so cellular automaton. This is non-sequential computing, so it's sort of fancy engineering computing, but it's something I found cool. Um, the simulation is really a GIS, uh, application that shows how patterns emerge over time from the interaction between adjoining locations on a map. And that's how complex systems operate. Uh, and this is what I worked on during my own ACLS digital fellowship. But this shows you in a short time what happens over a much longer period of time as people talk to each other. So none of these sources that I've shown you so far involve crowdsourcing. Uh, all of them involve the deliberate collection of data and creation of databases and visualizations by researchers and their students. Uh, oh, that's, the, that's what the computer simulation looks like when it starts. Um, we do hope to incorporate more public interaction on our Atlas project in the Commons section that we have not yet activated. I've applied for funding twice now to do that, but I haven't got it yet. Uh, the, we intend to offer users a chance to upload their lesson plans or interpretations based on our linguistic atlas data. We don't, however, hope to collect data in this way. We experimented with crowdsourced data collection about 15 years ago. Uh, and it was always unsatisfactory because it never met the conditions to make a real research sample. You could get lots of data, but it would also always be heavily skewed to certain kinds of people in certain places. Uh, another problem is that a few people would follow the directions, but many would not. Uh, we got a lot of data from some places, like New York, uh, and not so much from others. In our experience, uh, in this, our experience has replicated what we hear and see from other research operations. That is, that there are a small number of people who make the most contributions, people don't follow directions, and you don't get a research sample. Uh, in short, we found it better to make our research sample deliberately, even if it costs more, uh, than to create an inadequate sample more cheaply from trying to use crowdsourcing. DigiLab, then, has worked out really well as a central location for the digital humanities at my university, 
both as a place for people to learn about digital humanities methods and as a place online where projects can be displayed. After the failure of the university's research computing center to meet the needs of the humanities, works great for the other scientists on campus, just not us, um, and after our failure to operate a digital humanities program by hiring faculty, the success of DigiLab is really worth noting. Partnership with the University of Library has been a really key factor. The library is the institution at the university whose mission to preserve and share information is most closely aligned with what we're trying to do in the digital humanities. While individual researchers and developers will always be required to maintain the software they develop, now we can be confident that our digital creations have a place to stay over the long term. Having a physical location for DigiLab is important for the creation of a community of researchers who can share their skills as well as their findings. As my complex systems research has shown about other aspects of language and culture, interaction between people is what creates stable and continuing habits of behavior. The establishment of DigiLab has begun to do that for us at Georgia in ways we couldn't achieve before. Time will tell, but I hope that DigiLab will be the center of a sustainable digital humanities community of Georgia. Thanks. We would like to invite some questions. Well, I certainly have a lot of questions, but I, I, I just don't want to overtake. If there's anyone else who I will have one, but I need to think a bit. Yeah, oh, okay. The, same here, sort of so phrase, yeah. the, the questions are coming. If okay. you can I, have a, yeah. I have a question okay. to begin with. Okay. I, I hope it doesn't involve any of the other questions that are coming. <laughs> My guess is we all have very similar questions because this is all very exciting. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I really like the way you frame infrastructure, digital humanities infrastructures as, as communities, content and tools. And I think this is the new way of uh, framing infrastructure these days within at least the Swedish environment. Uh, previously, we've been concentrating on labs with crazy amounts of technical sort of tools, physical technical tools. We have gone beyond that model nowadays in, uh, in Sweden, I would say. We see that they only add to our overhead, so when we actually ask, ask for external money, it can, it can hinder this process. If we have a 78% overhead, for example, to hire one mm -hmm. person, that's basically almost two people that we need to hire. Mm -hmm. So uh, logistically speaking, what's your sustainability plan? How many years do you envisage initially DigiLab to, to operate? I think that uh, the model that I'm trying to set up where faculty research grants should return money to the library every time is something that help, will help to sustain it. That the uh, I published an article about this, actually, with my university librarian some years ago that I, I may be the only one in the humanities who's doing this right now, where when I write a grant proposal, it's got computer services as a line item in it, and I apply for 10000 a year or something like that, and that money goes straight to the library. Yeah. That it doesn't have to be named money for some particular piece of equipment. If all I'm buying is computer services, then it's up to them to spend the money to keep the infrastructure up. Um, now the infrastructure part, we've always been able to get computers when we wanted them, you know, that you could find money to buy things, but you could never find money for people. And that's where the library comes in, that we have two kinds of people who are involved in the digital humanities at Georgia, that there are two librarians who provide the continuity in the place and to help organize talks I arranged for a graduate assistantship from the graduate school at the university uh, that shared with the Atlas and DigiLab so that that person, currently it's a he, it's Joey, uh, he goes over there and gives seminars on R and gives seminars on uh, Excel and uh, talks about uh, a number of things. And there are other graduate assistants who come in and talk about software that they know how to use. So that uh, the, the library staff members are just crucial. You have to have somebody who pays for somebody on a continuing basis to keep the place going. But the second kind of 
person is us. That we are interested in digital humanities, we are using techniques. Uh, what we need to do is go to DigiLab, based on faculty money or research money that comes in from elsewhere. We just need to show up in DigiLab and share what we know with people, because people who don't know how to do what we know how to do will come. And that that's really where we have to be. I, I think it's unreasonable for all digital humanities people to do what I do. Exactly. I teach programming. I mean, how many digital humanities people do you know who teach programming? You know, they just, there aren't any. And so I don't expect that everybody's going to do that, but people need to be able to come and see how things work and talk to others who can give them a helping hand to get started. Uh, and I, I don't go and talk about programming. You know, I just do that in classes for students. But uh, we do talk about how to, how to do other things. And so those two kinds of people are how you do it. And then if you can, get people to put in for computer services money in grant proposals. That can help the library with the uh, capital improvement. Thank you so much. That was very, it was enlightening. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. Um, and uh, my question will be on, of course, Linguistic Atlas project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, once again, I mean, I'm pretty amazed that you were so incredibly early with digitizing stuff, you know? That's what this country has <laughs> been doing in the ages, but uh, now we are there uh, with a bunch of, uh, you know, cards uh, in our archives. Uh, but anyway, um, two questions uh, on maintenance and access. So you mentioned that, that for example, using Python was not uh, the best idea. Right. Uh, a, a bit worrying to me because I just started learning Python. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, um, so you, you recommended Perl, for example. But is there, what in this setup with the DigiLab and the cooperation between the university and the library, is there some specific person whose uh, sort of task is to maintain Linguistic Atlas project and do the programming, or is it you who still do it, or how, how, is it, how does it work? And another thing is about the access to this data. So is it like, you know, uh, open access, or like basically for everyone around the world, or mm -hmm. do you have any issues, or have you ever thought about not having it as open access, or, yeah? Your uh, thoughts on this the, I'll answer the second question first. Yeah. The, uh, we give everything away, all the time, uh, so that that I figure that the federal government has helped to pay for it, and the state of Georgia has helped to pay for it, and mm -hmm. so all the citizens of the state of Georgia and America, and by extension anybody else in the world, mm -hmm. are welcome to everything we have. Mm -hmm. You can download all of it if you want to. Uh, when we're currently working on a project, our current project is a National Science Foundation project where we're doing automatic vowel extraction, and we've got two million vowel measurements that we mm. use computer tools to extract. We're not giving that away yet, mm. because we're still, you know, getting it finalized, and then we want a chance to do some analysis on it before we just put it up for everybody. Mm. But actually, if you come to this talk about phonetics that I'm going to give tomorrow, you can have it all today, oh. if we use our <laughs> online tool. So that's what we want to do, is just give everything away to everybody all the time. Not all humanists can do that because there may be copyright issues. Mm, yeah. We conducted all of this research ourselves and so we can give it away. Uh, we have human subjects permission or it's exempt from human subjects, uh, human subjects because it's too old. Uh, but we've also sanitized it so nobody can go find the people that we talked to. Uh, we took out all the names and uh, personally identifying information. So what we give away doesn't reveal who the subjects, research subjects were. So we're still following human subjects guidelines. But that's the whole point is that we want to give it all away. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want money. You know, somebody already paid, mm -hmm. so it's cool. Uh, now the first question was about maintenance. maintenance. The, the system administrators at the library will install the latest updates for Perl or Drupal or basic operating environment mm. stuff, but anything that has to do with a user interface, mm. anything specific to the project, we have to maintain. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, and we expect to have to maintain that forever. If the Linguistic Atlas Project stops and nobody maintains it, then it will eventually not work. Sort of like our Python project. We just don't do Python anymore because we found out that it doesn't make sustainable products. Mm. Uh, if Python is really popular, mm. and I have nothing bad to say about Python, <laughs> uh, except that if you make something in Python, uh, you will have a heavy task <coughs> maintenance in the years ahead. Uh, if you make something with the .NET framework with C Sharp, or you make something uh, in Perl, uh, C Sharp gets updated pretty often. Perl gets updated somewhat often, but in my experience, those are a little bit better about being backwards compatible. Uh, it's not an advertisement for Microsoft, but it, you know. It's just experience. And so you really have to be careful in what tools you choose mm -hmm. to make things. Java, we started with Java, uh, doing things with Java in our user interface, but then Java has horrible security problems. Mm -hmm. And so we now use some JavaScript, which doesn't, uh, and HTML, matched up with HTML5. Uh, level five to make our website, which we hope will be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. But I'm always on the email with my uh, developer Ilka in O, talking about, oh, we need to do this or we need to do that, and he sometimes does it. Uh, so maintenance is a problem. Uh, I don't have. There's no easy answer for that. There always has to be somebody watching the store in order to keep your maintenance going. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm a bit of a novice in this, but I, I was curious about the question of ownership because you talk about you moved from Chicago, I think, to Georgia, right? Mm -hmm. And then also these people who kept moving away. And this site is sort of dependent on those faculty staying at Georgia, I would think. I mean, so is there a, I mean, do you have contracts with people? and, and or is there just a sort of understanding of who owns the data and where, what will happen to it if somebody wants to take it someplace else? Uh, this is dependent in part on your university. Okay. The, uh, the Linguistic Atlas Project is sponsored by the American Dialect Society. Mm -hmm. And so the American Dialect Society has ownership of our old paper records. And because all of our digital products were produced at the University of Georgia with money, federal money that didn't come directly to me as a person, but came to the university, then the university claims an interest in digital products that we've <coughs> created. And we spent about a year at one point creating uh, an agreement for joint ownership between the American Dialect Society and the University of Georgia. So this means that uh, the American Dialect Society can do whatever it wants with the digital stuff, because it's part owner, and it doesn't have to ask the university but the university can keep all of the uh, digital product forever. Uh, individual faculty members at the University of Georgia, technically, if they do their work on university time us using university equipment, the university owns their digital product. Now, this is a difficult issue, that if you were a faculty member and you made uh, teaching program, let's say you made a course that you then sold, uh, and other people elsewhere were using your digital course, then you might think you could make money on it, but at my university you'd be wrong. That the university would own it and uh, you'd have a problem. Now, you can get around that by having a home office or getting yourself a storefront someplace and having a computer there and saying that you did all of your digital development at that place so that the university didn't own what you invented. And I actually did that about 15 years ago when I was doing technical consulting with a bunch of lawyers. Actually engineers who were working for lawyers. Uh, but I filed a patent application until I found out that patents were a racket. Uh, but the point was that I had a site separate from the university that uh, I 
did that work out, and so I could claim that it was separate. I have since given up all desire to make money and to work with lawyers and engineers <laughs> and just, no, I'm just going to stay at the university so that that's inactive now. But that's what you would have to do at my place. But it will be different at every university what the university's intellectual property regulations are. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Carolina. I work as a librarian here at the university. And I wonder if you could expand a bit on your crowdsourcing experiences, which you mentioned briefly. Like, how did you do it? Did you do any sort of, did you just open up for it? Or did you have some sort of engagement event or, yes? Okay. In general, basically. Well, in our, in our work on the Linguistic Atlas Project, we're interested in how people use different words or use different pronunciations or different grammar in different places. And so starting in the early 2000s, we put up calls, oh, come take our survey online and tell us what, what you think. But what we found out was that a lot of the people who started to fill it out got bored and quit. Or they were, as, as the, the psychologists say, creative in the way that they put things down so that they would put down things that nobody ever heard of or that were just kind of X, 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 what is that, you know? That it would just be data that we didn't quite know what to do with and that we had, uh, we were getting data from computer literate people. Now, on my other survey, you know, the rest of my survey research project, we create a real sample by finding actual human beings, and we go there in person and talk to them. Uh, we know who they are. We know how they fit into a quota sample uh, so that we feel that we are safe in making generalizations about how people in an area might talk based on what these people said. But we simply can't do that with crowdsourcing. I had a, uh, a student who did crowdsourcing on Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Yes. <coughs> and uh, the Mechanical Turk worked fine. You can pay people to process data for you uh, in that Amazon system. It's not very expensive. There are people who try to make a living by making a few cents on processing different responses. But again, we, we just weren't satisfied with the quality of data that we were getting back uh, so that it was, we're just not convinced. Mm -hmm. Just a follow-up question, or maybe an idea. Mm -hmm. So what if you use, um, because you talked about local engagement in Georgia, and how it builds a community mm -hmm. around what you do because you're in the environment. Um, so what if you did crowdsourcing through the libraries so that the local libraries, like public libraries, would gather a crowd and they do this sort of survey together, which means that the computer literate people can ask questions about what does this mean, mm -hmm. uh, and then you have sort of libraries as a facilitator for the crowdsourcing, and you could do this in several libraries. Do you see my point? Mm -hmm. could, could that maybe increase the quality of the data, or in what ways could you do to still get a sort of big outreach but good data. Okay. The uh, data that you'll get will be from people who go to libraries. Mm. Not everybody in the community uses the, the civic library or the university library. How many students in my class set foot in the University of Georgia library? Like none. If they do everything online, they just don't go. And so, yes, you could do that. But what you would be accessing is a specialized population who were library users. I had um, another student who did data collection at grocery stores. And what she did is she set up a table outside of large grocery stores in several different places. And then as people were walking in, she would ask, oh, would you like to uh, do a university survey? In my state, everybody loves the university. The university is just, they just think it's great. It's, they, on Saturdays in the fall, we provide entertainment through football. Uh, and in the winter, entertainment through basketball. And so they mainly think we're a sports institution. <laughs> but they like us. And so they'll talk to somebody who says, you know, we're a University of Georgia. Here's the university, you know, sign. 
and would you talk to me? And, and people would do that. We, uh, she thought she got a more general population that way because everybody goes to the grocery store, although today it's not so much true because there's a whole class of people who just phone the grocery store and say, this is what I want, and then a delivery man brings it. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's difficult. Well, I think, uh, I would suggest you said public libraries, which has a much greater outreach than university libraries, uh, mm -hmm. and they do actually attract a, a much broader crowd than one would expect. Oh, well, they do. Uh, but the crowd that you get is the people who go to libraries. Which and is a fairly large part of the population. I mean, we hope so. We, we hope so. But I'm not sure that that's demonstrated. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a million visits to a library, to a library system, uh, it may be from 10,000 people. Uh, you know, it won't be if you have a million population and a million visits to the library, there'll be repeat visits by the same person uh, more than they will be, you know, one visit per person per year. So that's, that's the issue. If you could demonstrate that everybody in a community used the library, then what you suggest would be great. But I don't think it's true. Uh, or at least I think it needs to be demonstrated in order to uh, be able to use that for sampling. In similar lines, I'm wondering, you, you mentioned that you collect uh, information and you collect data and content using students and researchers. Yes. Uh, and, and in this case, you, I guess you have a research question when you actually do any collection of data. Yes. That is overarching and is ontologized accordingly to what you have. Yes. Okay. Which is closer to the university's mission, I suppose, in the sense that you know, you're producing knowledge that is sort of like specialized. Yes. Well, what we, uh, all of our data collection from human beings is controlled by the Institutional Review Board. And I'm not sure what it would be called here, but in America, if you're dealing with human subjects, then you have to apply for permission to a board at the institution who will judge whether you are dealing with at-risk populations or whether you're doing reasonable things with people and that you're going to protect their anonymity and uh, the, the control the whole, whole process. So that all of the things I've talked about where students have collected things have done that. Uh, that we have gotten permission from the Institutional Review Board uh, to go collect those. But then once we get that, I mean, we've used different uh, creative ways of doing it. We did a completely random sample using telephone numbers in the same way that election polls do. Uh, but now that's more difficult because people don't have landlines anymore. They, they don't have cell phones. And uh, if you're like uh, my wife, you won't answer your phone if you don't know who's calling. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, everybody has different habits about that. So this problem of effective sampling from human populations is a really big problem at the moment. Uh, and we do need to follow appropriate procedures for the protection of our research subjects. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Uh, I will probably ask a question to all of you here, representing some digital humanities uh, centers or whatever. Like how? Are you guys financed? I mean, uh, at Uppsala University, and if if there are any sort of parallel case to what yeah, Bill is it's, it's about. very very similar, and I think it's quite interesting because we went yeah, through it. But, but I am, you know, yeah. I'm interested in that. So it's very similar. We're financed by one research area, and whom some his field and Technat. So we are above, sort of overarching the faculty okay. up to the but, sort of other. But the the, the the budget of the library is it like a completely different story, or is it somehow? It's a completely different story, completely but we work together story. as okay. much as possible. Yeah. And I think we need to work more. I, personally, I think this is something that comes up from at least my own experience of working in Uppsala, but also in other places, is that unless you actually collaborate and unless you advance together, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no way any, any little initiative would be sustained. Mm -hmm. It has to be sort of an umbrella collaborative work with many people, mm -hmm. not just one face of you know, one professor doing their thing mm -hmm. or you know, one yeah, person yeah, doing yeah. the thing. It has to be something that comes from uh, the, the bottom up, 
Mm. And sadly, in Sweden, I would say the bottom is researched sometimes mm. because that's the only part that is not sustainable. Everything else can be, but research is something that is can yeah. be very ephemeral and periodic and trendy and come. Yeah, it's people depend. Yeah. On, I mean, like people come and go, and that's the problem. I mean, exactly. People come and people go. <laughs> I mean, but you also you have to account for that because it's good that you have yeah. people come and go. In the rest of the anglophone universities. That's something very normal, that people, you know, do their PhD somewhere, go somewhere else, then they do something mm -hmm. else, then they, or, and it's what it's like, but also it's it, taken into consideration. I think you can't, this is something we discussed with Bill, but I don't think I left you some time, more, more, much time to say your opinion about this, but my personal opinion mm -hmm. is that when you have a digital humanities sort of initiative in any university, it has to gear up to what there is already in that university, what are the strengths mm -hmm. and the competences, because, you know, we can come up and say, Bill and I can now sit around and say, okay, let's do a or Max and I, you know, we can say let's let's do let's do a virtual reality lab. It can it can be done, but maybe there is something like this already that we can take advantage of. So I think for me, digital humanities is still in essence humanities in the sense that you have you need the content. Mm. If you don't have a content and you have no critical questions, mm. I mean we can do maps all we like, but if we do one like to, to boil it to my own research interest. But if we do one point maps that basically, you know, exist already in paper mm. form, then why do we do digital? Mm. Yeah. Just as simple as that. Mm. But the DigiLab, is it like, um, did I understand it correctly, so that the library also pays for it, so just, I mean, it's, it's the university and the library investing the money into the DigiLab, right? Well, the, the university supports it through the library. Through the, the library, library yeah. has a budget. Yeah. It comes from the general university budget, and their mission is to have library facilities and um, uh, keep all the keep all the books, and now keep a bunch of digital stuff too, and work for the state, yeah. so that they have a lot of things that they do. Yeah. And so, uh, what the library is paying mm -hmm. at the moment is space, square footage in a library building, which costs money to heat and cool and clean, but they don't notice because that's just kind of folded into the regular budget. They have to have system administrators for all of their digital stuff, mm -hmm. whether it's the long-term storage, which is a huge problem, mm -hmm. uh, the long-term storage of Peabody multimedia stuff, or whether it's Galileo the, uh, with hard drives and active computers, they have to have system administrators. Mm. And they agree that those system administrators also work on DigiLab, mm. but they don't really notice. They didn't they have, to have to hire extra people mm. to do that. Mm. Uh, and uh, they do pay for the digital humanities coordinator, a librarian, mm. and the GIS librarian, who's on the library staff, and so they're paying for two salaries, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. So that's a major own, expense in the budget. Do they have their own research projects, the librarians, or do they just coordinate? They're coordinators and trainers. That's that they don't, mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't have an expectation of doing research. Our digital humanities coordinator is interested in the field and in promoting things, so she has done things like um, have a VAT camp. Mm -hmm. A VAT camp in America is a place where it's sort of advertised and everybody shows up on a weekend mm -hmm. to do at a national level what uh, we do weekly uh, in DigiLab. So she's been involved in that, been involved with the conference called Haystack in America. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Haystack is the other digital humanities conference besides the big DH conference that's going to be in Utrecht. Yeah. Utrecht is much yeah, better, yeah. so it's, it's much cooler. <laughs> but Haystack is a bunch of people who get together and chat about what they're doing, and mm -hmm. it's also reasonable. But it's the kind of thing that we want to do at DigiLab on a local level, transferred to a more national level. So does the library receive also money for storage for the servers or, or whatever storage uh, and make to that? Well, the money, I gave the money. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of that, but they put in some of their own. Exactly. And uh, the equipment that they have is not well separated from yeah. their other equipment. That if they have, you know, hundreds of terabytes of storage that they keep someplace in a big storage machine, 
then we have a few. Yeah. Um, right. Rather than buying a separate machine yeah. for DigiLab. And so when I contribute money to them, then that helps them buy a better piece of uh, equipment or uh, some extra VM licenses. They do cost money. Um, they do. And so that money that I have provided to them does help, but that uh, it's kind of folded in yeah. to the library budget in a way that doesn't make a big impact on it. That's great. Yeah, because uh, we've been, oh, oh yeah, uh, well, basically, uh, infrastructure within the humanities has become an issue in this country as well now. Um, and we have some specialized calls, you know, like funding calls <laughs> uh, to create like larger infrastructural, uh, infrastructural efforts within the humanities. The problem is <laughs> that the calls pay for like three years mm -hmm. and you create something. And then, like, there is not a single person in the world who knows what will happen to that stuff after the researchers are done. Yeah. So, and, the, the, unless the, you the, talk to the library. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. But but that's that's the point, you know. It's uh, there's been some discussion of what is going to happen uh, with those uh, with the results of those infrastructural mm -hmm. efforts, and the university has taken action, uh, and there has created some sort of very <laughs> well. I have been uh, to these meetings um, uh, where we were presented sort of here where we are going to store the stuff, but then it's not through the library. Uh, it's through the IT services or something mm -hmm. like that. And I wonder, you know, I really want the library to be in that somewhere. Uh, but this is an internal discussion. It's just, you know, some, some bunch of people here who has been working with infrastructure. Yeah. This is so. what we're hoping for. And I'd like to yeah. say that there's, a, there's also, in Sweden, you have larger initiatives beyond three years. But these have to be of national importance. Yeah. And in order to make something of national importance, sometimes you have to look back into your own content as an institution, which I think uh, is, we are getting there now. Mm -hmm. uh, slowly, slowly catch a monkey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as the old saying goes. Mm -hmm. yeah. My experience at Georgia is that the IT infrastructure is not your friend. Mm -hmm. the, they have rules that will prevent you from what you need to do. They are not interested in the storage and dissemination of information, that they are interested in getting everybody's paycheck paid. Um, and in processing data for all of our colleagues in other parts of the campus, but the IT infrastructure is simply not there to do what you want to do. And the library is. Yeah. But the library is most aligned with what humanists want to do. And so the task is to talk to librarians and say, hey, we're, um, we're in the same boat with you. Mm -hmm. If you go to Utrecht, in July, what you will find out is that about a third of the people there are librarians. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. And uh, this is this massive shared interest between working in libraries and doing digital humanities. And it's really quite close. The head of the ADHO, International Organization for Digital Humanities, for a long time was the dean of uh, the library school at the University of Illinois. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that this is something that we just need to recognize, it, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that we have common cause. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should wrap it up and we want to have a drink, perhaps. We have a small reception okay. for you here in the library. So you have the chance to mm -hmm. stay around and talk more uh, to uh, Professor Kretschmann. And, uh, Please stay alone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.